I guess the two most frequent arguments that I hear or read uh, against nuclear is that uh, number one is too expensive. And the second one is that it, the, the waste is too, too dangerous, too much of an issue. And from re- reading some of your work and, and, and some, other, some other stuff that I, I know that both of those are not really that big of an issue a, a, as, the, as the people make, them, make it sound. But I also know that you disagree with both. So why don't we talk about that? Maybe let, let's maybe start start off with the price. It, it is nuclear really the most expensive form of energy, and it, is it really that expensive? I don't think it is. I think it's cheaper in the long term. Again, it looks at, you have to look at the time horizon, and there's un, unfortunately a lot of misinformation and uh, apples and oranges comparisons out there. Like Lazard does this levelized cost of energy mm. comparison that I think is very disingenuous and and, and not complete. Um, and it's portrayed, even though they have all the caveats in the fine print, the way it's portrayed is that this is an apples and apples comparison. And it's not obviously looking at the cost of real cost of so, uh, storage for in, the intermittent aspect of renewables. Um, and I think some of their life expectancy assumptions are dubious um, in the maintenance issues involved. But I think we know that nuclear plants can last 60 to 80 years and even longer if they're maintained and, mm-hmm. and well kept up, right? And we know that some renewable wind and solar power generally like 20, 25 years, probably 20 years for wind max. I mean, after about 16 years, there's data in Europe that shows that the the overall of um, generation capacity to, to goes off a cliff with wind power. And starting around 16 to 20 years, it just gets so expensive to maintain them that it almost doesn't make sense. Without the the huge subsidies, it doesn't make sense to keep them alive, right? Mm-hmm. So, to, But oftentimes, the assumption for, for wind turbines is 30 years in these models, which is crazy. It's, um, it's 10 extra years that you're likely going to get out of them um, in any meaningful uh, generation capacity. So we, we have to look at the time frame of what we're talking about. You can't compare, let's say, the first 20 years of a nuclear plant to 20 years of a a wind farm or or solar plant, right? You have to look at the full kind of life cycle of that asset in that investment. And so when you start looking at 60-year or 80-year timeframes, and we know everywhere around the world where nuclear has been deployed at scale, the electricity prices are generally comparable to fossil fuels or, or less expensive. Right. I mean, when we so we have a lot of data and evidence for this. Now, recently, we've had huge cost overruns uh, and, you know, kind of misallocation of capital in some ways. Um, You know, the Vogel plant, for example, in in the United States has huge cost overruns. But a lot of this, there's some converging factors that are creating these increase in costs. First is just the level of regulation. Um, and litigation that these kinds of projects have to go through. Um, the the projects that were built in the 60s, 70s um, didn't have nearly the level of uh, red tape that they had to wade through and compliance costs that they do today. So that's one is we've all, almost criminalized this uh, endeavor and made it so expensive to kind of wade through that process. Also, because of that, um, it's drawn out the timeline. So one of the biggest costs in a nuclear plant is how long it takes to build it. Right. I mean, that is directly going to correlate to what the capital investment is. If you have to spend an extra year, two, three, four years to build it because of all of the regulatory impositions on it or litigation that you have to deal with, um, that's going to add a tremendous amount of cost. And then also we had the workforce. You know, we had a workforce that is not used to building these things anymore in many parts of the world. Um, it's not true in, in certain countries, but like in the U.S. as an example, we haven't really built nuclear plants in decades. So we don't have a robust trained workforce that has the expertise and knowledge to build these things efficiently and effectively. Like when you're banging these out, it's like anything. If, you, if you're going to do it month after month, year after year, and you have a whole team of people that are trained up and used to doing it, obviously you're going to build something much more efficiently with a lot fewer errors and issues than a team that's just starting to has to learn on the job. So it's not like there's one answer to this. There's, there's multiple con- converging uh, trends that are unfortunately leading to higher capital costs for some of these um, newer nuclear plants, but there's no reason it has to be. And in ultimately nuclear, I think is 
a cheaper source of electricity. And when you start looking at all of the costs and benefits, the, you can't ignore the, the substantial um, benefits that nuclear is del- delivering in this. So what do you think that the Australian energy minister means when he says, bring on the debate you know, for nuclear because uh, I can destroy it by just saying that it's the most expensive form of energy? What, what does he really mean? You know, that, I mean, he's a, he's a man, I don't know him, but he, I don't know if he's a serious man, but he's a man in a serious position who takes serious decisions for the future of a com- the whole freaking continent, right? Mm-hmm. So what, what does he mean? I mean, he must have some something to back it up. Well, I think what we're seeing with, and I'm not referring just to him, but more generally to politicians in general and elected officials that are in this position of power that are making these kinds of similar comments, because we're seeing this across, not just in Australia, we're seeing this, you know, we're seeing this in California, New York, other countries, um, is the incentives for them are to get reelected. And oftentimes they want to go wherever wherever it's going to give them the most votes and the positive sentiment in the shortest amount of time. And there's mm-hmm. no accountability longer term. They're not even going to likely be around or in office um, when the ramifications of these decisions happen. So if public sentiment is anti-nuclear in pro solar and wind, uh, it's a lot easier for politicians to embrace that, that platform, right? And mm-hmm. to go against that could cost them votes or it's a lot of education uh, to bring everyone up to speed. So I, there's these elements all are at play, but I think when you start really dissecting the incentives involved for politicians, you start to understand why they make these decisions because they have all the benefits and none of the accountability over the long term uh, because they're not even going to be around. Mm. But so there's, there's not something that you can say like, okay, nuclear is way more expensive in Australia. So he actually has a point. Like you, you don't think he's got a point. He's just trying to win vote, votes. Well, you know, I'm not familiar with all the nuances of all the Australian markets. So I don't want to yeah. you know, pretend that I'm an expert in Australian energy system. Um, but in general, I think, you know, you, these same trends you're seeing across the world where there's this narrative that solar and wind are the cheapest form of energy, right? Mm-hmm. That it's totally untrue. Um, it, if you look at it, a few core uh, metrics in isolation, you can make the data say whatever you want. But if you take a full cost accounting perspective, these are not the cheapest, right? But that is what you hear from politicians over and over and over. Why would we build nuclear when we can build these cheap renewables, right? And that's not true when you really look at the full cost accounting of it. So that is, you can't look at these things in isolation. And the thread on Twitter that I wrote all about this, that I think you you first um, saw some of my content, uh, why nuclear beats solar. And if people are curious, they can go to that thread. My um, account is at Brian Git on Twitter, and, and it's a pinned tweet, so you can see it. It goes through all the reasons nuclear beats solar, and in a more comprehensive way to put all of those ideas together. Because if you look at these in isolation, it's easier to kind of just cl- make these claims without backing it up with real evidence. Um, so it, it's important to see that there it's a comparison. You can't just evaluate nuclear in isolation or solar in isolation because you're making a choice of one over the other. Right, right, right. I'm probably going to have a link to that thread somewhere because that's a very important thread. Was there was there somewhere in someone in that thread that sort of challenged you or was able to prove you wrong on one of these? points because I, w- I was looking for that i like looking for these type of things going in the comments and i think that i think the discussion is beneficial to get to some answers eventually but w- was there someone who sort of made a point that you thought oh, okay yeah i missed that that they're right let's see i mean i i certainly am not right about everything all the time <laughs> you know i've made many uh errors in in my past and i'm not saying that everything is flawless but i i think i spent a lot of time trying to w- have well researched each one of these points and and provided references and citations for them. There was nothing that stood out that was surprising to me. I I basically heard the same arguments over and over and over and over again. And some of these just are outdated arguments around waste, right? People constantly talk about, what do you do with the nuclear waste? I I don't even see nuclear waste as a huge problem. Um, I think it's a solvable problem. Yes, there, we need to have safe way to contain nuclear waste. There's no doubt about it, obviously. We, but 
it's safely contained today. Now, we don't have necessarily the the perfect ideal long-term solution in all cases, but we know that majority of the energy is still in that fuel. And I'm actually bullish on us being able to recycle a lot of that fuel in the future using these fast reactors uh, similar to, to Oklo and, and other new emerging technologies. So I don't actually see the waste as a big problem. I think it's going to actually be something for us to mine energy in the future out of, um, but it certainly doesn't pose any significant health risk to to the surrounding area, to the civilization. So that's one that just people hammer over and over, but it's just, they don't understand that the scale of this is so small. Like all of the nuclear waste generated for 60 years of operation, commercial operation in the United States, and we have 20% of our energy is coming from nuclear power. So they're not talking about a teeny percentage, can fit on a single football field stacked like 10 yards high. So what are we talking about? I mean, that's not a lot of waste to deal with, um, and we can certainly safely isolate that and contain it. We steal it, we store it in steel lined concrete casks. Um, it doesn't pose any harmful effect to anyone if, if it's isolated like that. I so, saw a video of, of they, they ran a train through one of those caskets or something like that. Uh, oh, yeah. They do, and, they do all kinds of crazy testing to, to, for obviously, and it's good reason, right? Yeah. You don't, you won't want to have an issue. And, you know, we've, we've had over 2,500 um, times where we're transporting in the US alone just around the country. So we, we've sent trucks with nuclear waste 2,500 times safely by rail, by truck, by ship, all around, the, you know, all around. And we've never had a problem, right? So it's not like, th- there's a lot of evidence to say that, you know, this waste byproduct is causing the severe uh, harmful effect on society. I like to believe that we, I mean, it, I guess it could potentially, you know, and, and anything could happen, but I, I like to believe that we're going to figure out exactly how to use that waste to our be- waste, quote unquote, to our benefit before it actually gets harmful to society but there's sort of this mentality behind it that oh it's too dangerous so let's just instead ignore it let's just not do anything about it because we don't know we don't know how to handle it instead of being like okay we have this amazing source of energy that makes a whole lot of sense if we just put more effort into it if we put more effort into figuring out and then more effort and dollars into R and D as to how, how do we deal with that with that waste? How do we, how do we make it useful? Not only you know store it safely, which we are doing right now, but how do we make it useful? And, and sort of that mentality that 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 irritates me at time at times that that doesn't really make sense. So. Agreed. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think about in general, you know, one of the biggest investments of time and energy on the global stage has been. Um, around climate change over the last 30 plus years. You know, all of these conferences, um, really since the early 90s, we the world has been convening and deploying resources or, and putting forward all these recommendations. And when I think about what have they achieved what have, in, in over three decades of effort, what have they achieved? And ultimately, we're generating a lot more CO2 emissions. If anything, we're going back to coal. Um, a lot of their recommendations have not worked. Let's, you got to be honest when things are working or they're not working. It's clearly not working. Imagine if we took all of that time, all that energy, all of that uh, collective brain power of the, at the global level and just had put it into building nuclear power plants and dealing with the waste. Instead of that, we would have basically solved this problem by now, exactly. right? Yeah. I mean, we, would have, we wouldn't have the, this concern over climate risk if we would have invested that level of time and effort um, into advancing nuclear. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I was um, sort of referring to. And I tried looking for pushback in, in, in the comments. And I did, I did come across some pushback, you know, that, that some of it, some of it made me laugh. Like when people would say, you know, people basically said that nuclear is less, there's less security to, to it and it's less reliable than solar. And and some of these things are kind of obvious that you take Germany as an example that immediately makes that go away. But um, one of them though, one of the pushbacks was that, Nuclear only looks reliable and, and your calculations only made sense b- 
because of survivorship bias and that, you know, it looks cost effective in the long term and even profitable in the long term because of that survivorship bias. Because I guess the person said that a lot of the reactors had to shut down or something like that, like in the 70s, and they never made it in those calculations. Like, is that true? Well, I think we have to look country by country here. It's hard to make general blanket statements. But for example, in the United States, there's no doubt that the reactors have gotten way more efficient over time. We're now up to about 93% overall uh, capacity factors of the right. whole fleet of nuclear reactors, and they were way less earlier on. So um, now France is an example is having some problems now with the maintenance of an aged old fleet. And the problem was if they would have in continued to invest in this infrastructure, in these assets, they wouldn't be suffering this challenge right now. But they also, even though France probably more than any country in the world put more investment and energy into building this robust foundational nuclear infrastructure, they they deferred the maintenance and they kicked the can down the road and they thought, oh, we're going to be divesting some from this and we're going to go more towards renewables. And so maybe we shouldn't invest in um continue our level of investment in these plants. And now there's, it's the chickens are coming home to roost. You're starting to see, you can't just expect things to work flawlessly without maintaining them and reinvesting in them, right? And so we're starting to see their capacity factors drop, plants go offline. It's not because inherent of the technology, but you got to maintain these things uh, adequately. So that's, I think you got to look country by country and situation by situation, but inherently, you got to reinvest. Exactly. Exactly. It makes a lot of sense. I'm, again, going to refer anybody who's watching this to that thread that you wrote on Twitter. It was really good. Um, I like the fact that you always you would post a link. And a lot of the – someone made me laugh. They, so, like, people would make, make claims but without mentioning their sources. And someone said, like, source, double dot, trust me, bro. Like, uh, you know <laughs> – that, that's my source. Just trust me. And uh, but you you mentioned your sources. I like that about you. That that's why I wanted to invite you because I I knew that you were a reasonable reasonable man. And um, this has been a, a great discussion. I've, I've I've went through all the topics that I wanted to talk about. Is there something that you wanted to talk about that I uh, failed to bring up? No, I think we covered a lot of ground, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come on. You know, if if, if people are interested in kind of further delving into these different ideas. I do write on my website more long form articles in addition to Twitter. And that's it, briangit.com. So if people want to kind of delve into more articles and background on this stuff, and obviously they can follow me on Twitter at Brian Git, um, is where I'm very active every day trying to get in engaged in these similar types of discussions. And I try to share everything I'm learning in, in real time. So, you mm -hmm. know, I, I spend a lot of time every day reading and connecting with folks in the industry. And I try to share any news and information I can on a daily basis. So those are like the two best places to continue to stay connected. Great. Great. Do, do you offer some type of a paid subscription service or something along those lines? Uh, no, not at this time. Everything's free. Mm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Did you think you're ever going to do that, by the way? Just yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm still, you know, um, I think content in general, you know, I don't want to make any blanket statements forever because I could change my mind. But my, my general feeling is that these ideas need to spread far and wide and that I don't want to put up paywalls around kind of the core ideas that I'm wanting to have a positive impact in the world. I think there's other potential ways to make money. We all need to make a living, obviously. But um, I, ideally, I'd like to... Anyways, we have a brief <laughs> interruption, but but you, you were saying that you believe that these things um, should remain free, and I absolutely agree with that. I mean, that's a, a noble cause. So it's... Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be following you, and I uh, encourage people watching this to go ahead and do the same. I think you have a lot of value to deliver, and uh, well, th thank you for uh, investing your valuable time in me. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity to chat and um, and look forward to doing it again, hopefully soon. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you for, yeah, I was going to, I was going to say that if, if you liked it, I, I'd be happy to have you back. So uh, yeah, thanks again. Thank you.